Good morning, everyone. So, <laughs> I know I'm like to get started. Welcome, everyone, to, uh, to today, Saturday of the YMC. I hope you are drier than I am. We have a wonderful treat. Uh, this is uh, Professor Francis Edmund Sue. Uh, he got his PhD in 1995 from Percy Diaconis, wonderful uh, combinatorialist and probabilist, many things. Uh, he's currently the Benedictine Carwell Professor, the right of mathematics at Harvey Mudd College. And uh, he also spent some time at Cornell, Caltech, MSRI. And Professor Sue is a well known educator. He has written and given a number of public articles, public lectures for both mathematics and sciences. Uh, he's the author of more than 55 papers and is a super supervisor of more than 60 undergraduate research institutions. He's won numerous awards, including such things as the Merton Hasse Award, Henry Alder Award, and the Heigl Award. And he was the research director for the MSRI undergraduate program in the 15, and he is, or was rather, the president of the MAA, Mathematical Association of America, between 2015 and 2017. So all of this is to say it's, it's a great honor to have him here today, and uh, I hope we'll all welcome Professor Sue, who's going to talk about polytopal generalization of Sperner's dilemma. Thanks a lot. It's uh, really exciting to be here to see a lot of the projects that uh, I saw some uh, yesterday. I got my uh, start in doing research as an undergraduate as well, and I know the powerful effect it can have on shaping uh, one's mathematical trajectory. I want to tell you a bit about a, uh, a problem, a sequence of problems uh, that arose out of a senior thesis project, actually, in 2000. Uh, before I do, uh, let me tell you about a game called Hex. How many people have seen this game before? Okay, some of you have. Uh, it is a, uh, a game played on a hexagonal board, uh, so hexagonal tiles, uh, and it's a, basically a diamond-shaped board. There's the same number of uh, uh, tiles on each side. And the object of the game is, it's a two-player game. Uh, the object of the game is for uh, players to either create a chain of tiles going this way across the board or this way across the board. You were playing this on a sheet of paper, you might do this with X's and O's, kind of like in tic-tac-toe, okay? The game uh, was first uh, invented by Hein in 1942. It was popularized by Nash in 1948, and Parker Brothers actually made a version of this game in 1952. Uh, Nash is uh, the same Nash as in The Beautiful Mind, if you've seen that movie. Uh, and uh, one of the questions that you might ask if you start playing this game, remember the players are alternately placing X's and O's. X's are trying to get from this side to this side, and the O's are trying to get from this side to this side. One of the questions you might ask if you start playing this game is, can the game end in a draw? Is there always going to be a winner? Or, at the end of the game, could there be some configuration, kind of like tic-tac-toe, where there's no winner? Okay. If you get bored at any point during this talk, you can draw a uh, uh, hexagonal board like this and start playing with your neighbor. Okay, so uh, I'm going to tell you about this uh, theorem uh, that we proved called the polytopal Sperner lemma. But before I do, I have to tell you about Sperner's lemma. Uh, and then after that, I'm going to tell you about a whole series of applications that I didn't realize um, when, I, when we first proved this theorem. Uh, that are kind of cool. Okay, so that's the plan for uh, this uh, morning. Okay, so Sperner's lemma is a rather simple statement, and it's going to seem a little strange at first. It's a combinatorial statement. Uh, it says the following: If you take a big triangle and you uh, break it up into lots of baby triangles, and you label the vertices of the triangle in a particular way, then something amazing happens. Okay, Are you with me? All right, so what we're going to do is the labeling has to satisfy the following rules. The corners of the big triangle have to be labeled differently. 
In this case, one, two, and three. Everybody see that? Okay. And then the rules of labeling along the side is if you're on the one, two side, then you want these labels to only be ones or twos. Are you with me? Okay. And then along this side, only what? Twos or threes. Okay, you're getting a pattern. And along this side, only ones or threes. And notice they can all be ones. That's, that's, cer that's certainly allowed. It just has to be either one or three. Everybody with me? And then on the inside, you allow either one, two, or three. All right. Is everybody with me on what the special labeling is? I know it sounds, it seems a little peculiar, but it, it relates to the geometry of the triangle. Yeah. All right. So uh, that's called a Sperner labeled triangulation. And Sperner's lemma says if you have a triangle labeled this way, a triangulation labeled this way, then it must have, guess what, a baby triangle that is a one, two, three triangle. Do you see one? Yeah? Uh, where? Here, I'll point to you. Here's one. Oh, do you, you see another? Yeah, there's one. Another one, yeah. In, in fact, what Spurs Lemma says is not just that there's a baby one to the triangle, it says that there, in fact, have to be an odd number. So, in fact, you found two, there has to be a third one, and there's one up here as well. Okay. Everybody with me? And in particular, an odd number is never zero. You know, there's always at least one. Yes, there's a question here. Uh, does it say that there has to be an upright triangle, or they must be upside down for one to two? They can be upside down. They can be. Okay, you're asking actually a really good question, a refined question, is what's the nature of these triangles? And I'll tell you, although this is not part of the talk, the, I'll just tell you since you're asking, it's a great question. Um, the triangle actually does have to satisfy some property. We can say a little more. We can say if these numbers are labeled one, two, three counterclockwise, that there in fact have to be one more counterclockwise triangle than clockwise triangle. Okay, so in particular, that's an odd number, and there's always at least one uh, counterclockwise triangle, which is kind of nifty. Do you see counterclockwise here? There's one. That's clockwise, and this is counterclockwise. Pretty happy? Oh, this is nifty. That's, uh, there's a whole lot I'm not telling you, by the way. This, is, this, this stuff is so cool. You guys are going to be so cool, really. Okay, great. Great question. So, um, uh, that's a, a very interesting, uh, strange combinatorial lemma, proved in 1928. And the amazing thing is, it has huge consequences. Okay? So, in particular, uh, it is equivalent to a theorem in topology which is an important theorem known as the Brouwer Fixed Point Theorem. Uh, and I should be a little more careful here to say that, well, I'll tell you what Brouwer Fixed Point Theorem says in a minute. Um, and this connection between the Brouwer Fixed Point Theorem and Spurs was actually, uh, it wasn't, Spurs wasn't developed in order to prove the Brouwer Fixed Point Theorem, but a year later, some Polish mathematicians realized that these two things are actually related. They're equivalent. And that's kind of nifty because it shows a connection between combinatorics which is a study of counting things, cleverly, and topology, which is the study of, of uh, in some sense, stretchy shapes, right? How, what properties of objects don't, don't change when you deform them, right? For those of you who haven't had topology, it's like analysis without the metric. Okay. Okay. So, um, I have to tell you what the Brown's point there is because it is an amazing theorem. Uh, many mathematicians would probably have it on their, have it on their top ten list of, of important theorems in mathematics. Uh, it basically says if you have a continuous function from a ball to itself, it must have a fixed point. Okay, and a ball is, topologically speaking, anything that doesn't have holes. All right. Uh, it's an, it's a. Uh, um, an n-dimensional theorem, so if it's an n-dimensional ball, this theorem is still true. But here's an example. If I take a map of Columbus, uh, and I crumple the map, and I throw it down somewhere in Columbus, and mash it down, lots of it down, then there is a point in the map that's exactly above the point it represents. Okay. Now what is that? That's why is that a continuous function? Well, I didn't tear the map. Okay, and I've sort of placed, I've shown you how to associate every point in the map with a point in Columbus. Are you with me? So I'm taking Columbus to Columbus. Right, okay. Everybody happy with that? Okay, so that's kind of an amazing theorem. 
Uh, and you can see, of course, continuity is important here because if I tore the map and I threw East Columbus into West Columbus, and West Columbus into East Columbus, the theorem would not be true. Also, if I threw Columbus over into Detroit, this map into Detroit, it's also not true. There's a point above the point it represents. Okay, great. Here's another uh, way to think about the theorem. If you take a, um, if you take a, uh, an aquarium, or fish, and you slap your hand against the side, the fish are all going to dart off in some direction, yes? And if they dart continuously, which means nearby fish move in nearby direct directions, then uh, the theorem says there has to be a point, uh, there has to be a fish that's, that's completely shocked, surprised, doesn't know what to do, okay? Doesn't know which way to dart because all the fish near it are doing different things. You with me? So another way to think of the theorem, it's a three-dimensional version. Another popular version you may have heard is the coffee cup uh, theorem. If you take a cup of coffee and you slosh it around continuously, then if you had taken a picture of the coffee before and you take a picture after, then there's got to be a point in the coffee that's in the same position. That's a fixed point. Okay, everybody happy with this? Lots of different ways to think about this theorem. You might be thinking, wait a minute, well, what if I just slosh the coffee a little more and I move that fixed point out? Well, what this is saying is you can't help but move some other point in the coffee back into its original position. Okay, so there's something very interesting happening here, uh, topologically, um, that's unavoidable. You have to have a fixed point. Now, um, the bright fixed point theorem has lots of applications. Uh, in particular, uh, one of the, the ones that you often hear about is uh, applications to solving um, uh, the exist existence of solutions to differential equations. Okay. Uh, another one that it may be uh, also kind of surprising is maybe a, 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 um, a uh, more accessible version is uh, some of you may have learned Newton's method in calculus. It's that, that uh, algorithm that helps you find, find what? Solutions to uh, functions uh, by iteration. Yes? Uh, zero is a function by iteration. And it depends on some iterative process. And what, what's interesting is, why does Newton's method work? Why is it that if you're close to a root, you actually will converge to a root? Well, it turns out you can prove this using a little bit of analysis. If you're close enough to a root, then this function actually is going to have a fixed point because it maps a region into itself continuously. Ah, and that must have a fixed point. And if this has a fixed point, then x equals, uh, then uh, x will equal, uh, uh, then what? Uh, then, if this has a fixed point, then you will in, find, in fact find a solution of, um, of uh, a, a root of this function. And now, of course, I'm blanking on, um, on y, but um, let's see. If you find a fixed point, oh yeah, yeah, right. x equals x minus blah, right? That's a fixed point, yes? Um, so this g of x equals x would say x equals this. Uh, so then this thing has to be zero. So the numerator has to be zero. Okay. Okay. Ah, interesting. Lots of practical applications as well. In fact, here's another one, surprising one in economics, known as the Nash equilibrium theorem. So some of how many of you have take, taken an econ class? Okay. Well, if you become a professional economist, you can't avoid this idea in economics called the Nash. Um, the idea of the Nash equilibrium. And basically, what it says is every game, the game is just a strategic interaction between players, has to have an equilibrium. An equilibrium is a set of strategies that the players can play that are mutually best replies to one another. Okay? So if you have seen the game Beautiful Mind, or the movie Beautiful Mind, um, uh, they try to explain this concept in the movie, but it's wrong. Okay, so after you hear this, maybe you'll go back and watch the movie and try to figure out what's, what's wrong about it. So the idea of a set of strategies for mutual best replies is if I'm playing a game, with, if I'm playing an interaction with a bunch of people, if you guys show me what strategies you're playing, then I have a number of options, and uh, it's a Nash equilibrium if the option that I choose is the best response to the set of uh, strategies that you guys choose. And that's true for all the players at the same time. 
that's called an equilibrium. The reason it's called equilibrium is that a game theorist would say, well, would make a prediction. This is how people are going to play the game, right? Because it's going to settle. There's not going to be an incentive for anybody to change their strategy. So this is the way often you predict is going to be the outcome of a particular interaction. OK, so you can see why that might be useful in income economics. Uh, and Nash's amazing result, for which he, one of the reasons he won a, a, a Nobel Prize in economics, because there isn't one in math, uh, is uh, for this theorem. OK, so the, the, the nifty thing is he, he proved this. He actually proved it originally using something called the Kakatani fixed point theorem, but then a year later realized it can actually be proved using the Brouwer fixed point theorem. And I'm not going to show you how. I'm just going to give you a sense of why it's true. Okay. So, and that's actually what happens when you attend a lot of academic talks. You're not going to understand all the details, but as long as you come away with an idea of why it's true, you can go back and, and understand why. So the idea here is I'm just showing you a very simple example. You have two players, rows and columns. If you play the rows and the columns of this matrix, <laughs> then, uh, then what? Well, I'm just showing you the payoff. If she chooses a strategy B and he chooses strategy alpha, then he's going to get $3 and she's going to get $1. Okay, that's, that's what this is. I'm just showing you the game uh, in which the payoffs are evident. And you might look at this and say, wait a minute, there's no equilibrium here because in Rose's strategy, uh, Rose's responses here, the best, the best thing she can play against beta is B. The best thing she can play against alpha is C because these are the biggest numbers in the, in the column, yes? And the best thing that column can choose in every row is this. It would be an equilibrium if the circles and the squares coincided, yes? What Nash's insight was, was, okay, well, maybe in these pure strategies, there, there is no equilibrium. But if you allow randomization, that's, that is mixtures of these, play this with probably a third, a third, a third, et cetera, then actually the space of strategies becomes a product of two things, in this case, a triangle and a line, and that's some geometric object. Are you with me? That's a blob. That's a ball. <coughs> Okay. And what Nash realized is if you have players that have incentives to deviate, that suggests a vector direction that this set of strategies wants to move in. It's like the fish in the aquarium, yes? And by the fish aquarium theorem, there is a point that doesn't want to move, which is a set of strategies that's stable in equilibrium. Oh, nifty. You're like, whoa, amazing, right? That wasn't so hard to communicate. And in fact, Nash's paper, Nobel Prize winning paper, is just three pages long. If you know a little analysis, you can read it. I urge you, encourage you to look it up. Okay, this is just one section uh, of the paper. Okay, what have I said? I've said Sperner is equivalent to Brower, and Brower is amazing. Yes? Okay, it does some amazing. Well, here's another cool application. We realized in 1979 by Gale that the game of hex actually can't end in a draw. This was actually proved in 1969 by uh, uh, some folks in a complicated way. And Gale realized, wait a minute, this actually can be proved. Well, he showed one proof that was combinatorial, but he showed another proof that was actually using the Brower fixed point theorem, a topological theorem which proves a combinatorial result, kind of amazingly, okay? And, uh, and that's kind of an empty application of, of, of uh, the Brown fixed point theorem as well. Okay, so let me now show you uh, how to prove Sperner's lemma. And this is Sperner's lemma in two dimensions, okay? So I've just described this for you. One, two, three, and then ones and two, one, uh, twos and threes along the two, three side, et cetera. Okay, so how do you how can you prove this? Well, here's one way to prove it. Basically, go through, think of this uh, this uh, triangle, this big triangle as a house divided into many rooms. Okay? And every time I see a one-two edge, I'll think of it as a door. Okay. And so I'll go through the house, and next to every door, I'm going to lay a couple of rocks down. Yeah. Uh, except if it's a boundary door, then I just put a rock on the inside. Are you with me? 
Okay, so here's a question, everyone. Count. How many rocks are there? Now you don't have to tell me the exact number. Just tell me if it's even or odd. Odd. How'd you do that so quickly? Even, 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 all inside, and every door, if you go down by a door, there's only evens inside, and in the boundary there's an odd number, yes? Why is there an odd number here? I mean, if I did, if I did this triangle division in a different way with a different spurt or leg length, why, would I, why can I guarantee there will be an odd number? It goes from, one, it goes from one to two. So it has to switch, yes? from one, between one and two, it's somewhere, yes? And if it switches back, it has to switch again. So in fact, and that's Sperner's lemma in one dimension, right? A triangle, a triangle in one dimension is a segment, line segment. And they're labeled differently, and they have to switch at odd number of times. Are you with me? Ah, nifty. So, uh, good. So that's Sperner's lemma uh, with a non-destructive combinatorial argument. Okay? All right. Um, but here's an interesting thing that was only realized uh, remember, this is 1929. It was only realized in the 1960s. It's actually a, a constructive argument, okay? And it goes like this. Think of this as a house with many rooms. In every one, two edges a door. Uh, but this time, what I'm going to do is I'm going to uh, lay down rocks. Actually, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to actually follow the rocks. So I'm going to start from the edge. And I, if, I, if I see a one, two door in the next room, I walk through it, and I walk through it, and I walk through it. And this will basically create paths, yes? Uh, and now notice what's going to happen. Either as you walk, you're going to end on the boundary again, or if you walk from the boundary, you have to end in a one, two, three triangle. You can't end over here because of the labeling conditions, yes? So it has to end somewhere, yes? Okay. So why must there be a boundary door that, that ends in a one, two, three triangle? Because why? There's an odd number on the bottom, and only even number get matched up by paths. So some, at least an odd number of them, have to match up with one, two, three triangle. And if there are any others, guess what? They have to be matched up by paths as well. That's why there's an odd number of them. Are you with me? And in fact, you can see the other thing we discussed earlier: counterclockwise and clockwise. I'll let you think about that. Why are there one more counterclockwise? All right, think about that if you're bored for the rest of the talk. That was two-dimensional Sperner Islamic. It's true in n dimensions. You just have to decide what you need. And here, for a tetrahedron I've shown you, if I label every corner differently and every edge one, two, you know, according to the labels of the corners, or every face according to the labels of the corners, one, two, three, or two, three, four, interior can be anything, then there must be an odd number of in this case, one, two, three, four tetrahedra, little baby one. Are you with me? Okay. Uh, and guess what? The proofs are similar. I encourage you to think about the two proofs I gave you and see if you can generalize them as well. Another thing to do if you're bored during the talk. All right. Everybody happy? Everybody happy with with uh, with uh, with Sperner's lemma? Okay. So as long as you understand this, then um, you'll enjoy the rest of the talk. Here's a cool application of Sperner's lemma to a, another economic problem, how, the problem of how you divide an object fairly among several people. It's known as the cake cutting problem. And when I say fairly here, I mean in an MVP fashion so that nobody envies anybody else's piece. Okay, there's many notions you can choose. Um, and the idea here is to think about the space of divisions of cake, the possible divisions, as a geometric object. Why? Well, each division of cake is a triple of numbers, which represent the physical widths of the pieces. Okay, And the sum of those widths has to add up to a fixed number. We might as well call it 1. And they have to be non-negative. And so guess what? That it cuts off a piece of uh, the first octant. It's a plane. And the part of the plane is a triangle. Okay. So this is the corner where the middle piece has all the mass. This is the corner where the first piece has all the mass. Are you with me? And along the bottom, where the z coordinate is zero, that's where the third piece is empty, but the other two pieces have some of the mass. Are you with me? Okay. So every point in this space, in this, every dot in this triangle is a division of cake. If I point right here, that corresponds to a division of cake. Are you with me? Okay. And here, because it's z is coordinates bigger, the third piece is larger. Yeah. 
So what we've done is we've, if you like to think about it this way, we've parameterized the space of divisions using this triangle. Okay, great. So um, what's the idea here to show that there is an entity free division of K for any set of players with reasonable uh, assumptions of their preferences? We triangulate the cake into small pieces. And then what we do is we, I'm going to, for every one of these corners, I'm going <coughs> to assign an owner. So if there are three people, let's say uh, Alice, Bob, and Carlos, then uh, I'm going to go to each of these corners and I'll give it to either Carlos or Alice or Bob or whatever. Okay. I'll tell you later how I'm going to do it. But if you assign an owner to every vertex, you can go to that owner and you just say, hey, Bob, which piece do you prefer? If the cake were cut like this, and I present the cake, and you tell me one, two, or three. Two, he prefers piece two for some reason, okay? Now, um, what, one of the questions you might ask is, what is going to happen, let's move away, but what is gonna happen if, for instance, I say to Bob, which piece do you prefer if the cake were cut like this? Now, I don't know anything about Bob's preferences, but if the first piece is all the mass and the other two pieces are empty, which piece is he going to prefer under reasonable hypotheses? The first piece, if he's hungry. He's a hungry player, yes? Okay. What about here? Which, no matter who the owner is, who, what are they gonna prefer? Piece two. And along the bottom where piece three is empty, which piece are they going to prefer? One or two. I don't know. I don't know. It's either one or two. It's not three if they're hungry. You with me? So in fact, the answers that I'm going to get in this way are Sparta Lima. Ah. Okay. So what do I know by Sparta Lima? There's a one, two, three, baby triangle. Yes. Okay. So now I haven't told you how how that's going to help us, but now let me tell you how I'm going to label the owners. I'm going to assign ownership. <coughs> I'm going to basically go through and assign owners to all the triangles, Alice, Bob, or Carlos, in such a way that every tri triple is an ABC triple. Are you with me? And if you choose the triangulation carefully, you can always do this. Okay. Turns out then, in fact, that a 1, 2, 3 triangle corresponds to an Alice, Bob, Carlos triple. And what it's saying is, in this division, Alice prefers piece one, in this division, Bob piece three, and Carlos piece two. Those are three very nearby divisions if the triangulation is kind of small. And so what it says is you could pick, if you like, the division that's right in the middle, and that will be an approximate MV free division. And it can be as, as close as you like to MV free, assuming your triangulation is as small as you want. Are you with me? <coughs> ah! So this is great. It's an approximate MV3 division. And if you actually want an MV3 division, we could use a little analysis. We repeat for smaller triangulations, get smaller and smaller 1, 2, 3 triangles. Yes? And well, because of compactness, if you know what that means, great. If you don't, don't worry about it. By compactness of this triangle, there has to be a convergent subsequence of triangles. So some of these will converge to a point, and that point will be Ah, interesting. This is great. We've just shown a, kind of an amazing theorem um, uh, known as the tape cutting theorem. Oops, don't want to show that. Non constructive versions of the cake cutting theorem basically uh, um, have been around since 1946. It's a result in measuring theory. Okay? But actually, how you find a division, that's, that's a more interesting question that economists and uh, game theorists have been interested in. And what we've just shown is that there is actually a constructive way to get an approximate MV3 division that doesn't involve dividing the cake into a bazillion pieces, which is what Perry and Mullen said in 1947. I've just shown you something, an argument by Forrest Simmons in 1980. The only assumptions we've made here are that the players are hungry and that the preference sets are closed, which means in the, in the analysis sense, it's a closed set. If you have a limiting sequence of divisions where Alice prefers piece two, then she will continue to prefer it in the end. Okay. Only two assumptions are true. All right, so I, I learned about this uh, when I was an undergraduate, and it, 
uh, it wasn't until I was in graduate school that a friend of mine came to me one day and said, hey, you know, um, I'm moving into a house with my three roommates, or four of us, and we can't decide how to divide the rent fairly in such a way that each person would prefer a different room. Because, you know, one of the rooms is really tiny, uh, but it's, uh, and another one is like really large, but it's next to a noisy window. Okay, so lots of things going on here. We can't decide how to divide the rent. Is there always a way, I wonder, to divide the rent in such a way that each person prefers a different room? I said, oh, you know what? I think I've seen something like this before, but it's for pay. <laughs> Thought about it a little bit and realized, oh, yeah, you know what? This is actually very interesting. If you think about which piece a player would prefer, in the corner where piece one has all the rent, she would no longer choose piece one. She'd choose two or three, yes? And along the bottom where three is empty, she'd prefer piece three. And here, they prefer any of them. That I actually didn't know at the time is something known as the dual sparner lemma due to SCAR. And under those conditions, in fact, I could prove a theorem, uh, that a uh, similar theorem that basically, as long as you have three conditions, closed preferences, just like before, uh, miserly tenants, nobody would pass up a free room. That's a condition you need. And of course, it's not always satisfied, but some houses, if you had a free closet, no one would choose it. You would have to pay somebody to live there, in fact, yes? Um, uh, but it also has to be a good house, which rules out a completely expensive house where every room is a million dollars a month, right? You wouldn't, nobody would choose any room. As long as you have these three conditions, then, there is an empty free division of room. All right, cool. So um, that's a little background. And now let me tell you about the polycopal smarter one. All right. So uh, things are going to speed up a little bit here, because now I'm just giving you a flavor of what's going on. But if you understand a good example, it, it'll take you miles. Uh, it'll take you far. So uh, here was a question that I posed uh, to an undergraduate for a thesis, undergraduate thesis project. I said, you know, I just read this paper by Atanasov which uh, showed a poly poly polygonal Sperner lemma, which says if you have, let's say, a hexagon divided lots of pieces, every corner is labeled differently, every edge here is one, every vertex here is either one or six, one or two, two or three, et cetera, then there must, something amazing happens. Uh, and what Atanasov said is there must be a certain number of triangles that have different labels. Notice the triangle can't have all six labels, so it has to be the, the next thing to do is to say, oh, well, let's just demand it has different labels. You with me? So Atanasov showed that the n gone, triangulated label this way, must have n minus 2 special cells. I call them full cells. Full meaning they have all the possible, uh, they have these different labels. Okay. n gone has n minus 2 cells, uh, full cells. So for a triangle, n minus 2 is 3 minus 2 is 1. Yeah. Oh, interesting. Uh, and, and so the question that I asked was, is this true? And actually, it's an answer I asked, conjectured, is that it's, it's true for polytopes as well. Any dimensional polytopes, except n minus 2 becomes n minus v. Okay, so I gave this to my student, Elisha Peterson. And what Elisha did in his, theorem, in his thesis was, was actually quite remarkable. Um, he wasn't able to prove this for all polytopes, but he was able to prove it for a special set of polytopes. Okay, And he generalized both the non-constructive and the constructive versions of the argument that we used earlier. The, the pebble, the laying down rocks, and the, um, uh, and the path ball argument. Oh, this is Elisha here. Uh, and so after he did his thesis, we got together with Jesus de la Huera, who's at UC Davis. It's an amazing PhD advisor, by the way, uh, so if you're thinking about grad school. Uh, and, uh, and we were able to finally solve the theorem, solve the, the, uh, the general case. But it, it rested heavily on uh, Elisha's initial work. And, uh, I'm just going to briefly describe how this goes. So uh, the, the first proof is a path following argument. And part of the problem here when you try to generalize the argument is you have to decide what the doors are. It's not clear what the doors are. And uh, when you do the, 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 if you follow the all possible branches, you don't get paths, you get branched paths. Okay, so you don't have this nice um, pairing up idea that you have before. Okay, 
Uh, and the way around that difficulty, it turns out, is to choose what's called a flag of faces. So that's a, a ascending sequence of faces of a polytope in successive dimensions, each contained in the other, which you're going to call distinguished. And those will help you say what the duals are. The second uh, argument is laying down pebbles, as we call them. And if you lay down the pebbles in a special way, then, in fact, um, when you count things, they work nicely. That's all I got to say. Okay. Okay. Um, and just to give you a sense of how the, the arguments go with the flags, you can see in these two pictures, depending on the flag you choose, you'll get different full sets. And that's why you might have, for instance, a lot of different um, uh, full sets. Okay. okay. Great, so now uh, I'm going to just show you four different applications that are kind of cool of the polytopal Sperner lemma. Okay. Um, the first is, just a few years later, I had another undergraduate work on a problem uh, uh, of um, um, finding a minimal triangulation of a cube. Okay, so what's a triangulation? It's a division of a cube of an object into n-dimensional triangles, if it's an n-dimensional object. These are called simplices, okay? And the question is, for a cube, what's the minimal number of simplices you need to divide the cube? So for a line segment, it's obvious. There's no division. For a square, you can, the minimal number of triangles you need to triangulate a square is two. That's, that's obvious. In three dimensions, it's five, and this is the picture of how you do it. A large, fat one in the middle, and four on corners. Yes? What was unknown was in dimension four, the tesseract. Uh, what's the minimal number of simplices you need? Okay. Uh, a, a paper in 1982 showed that 16 gave a 16 simplex triangulation of a cube. Uh, and uh, another paper used using some, an interesting hyperbolic geometry argument, which seems strange. Ask me questions later if you want uh, about how that works. Uh, but use an interesting geometric argument to show that you need at least 15. Okay, so we knew the answer was somewhere between 15 and 16. Um, and so what we started doing is we started looking at the kinds of triangulations you might use. So this is a triangulation. This is a vertex triangulation if you don't allow interior vertices. Uh, and um, the idea that we had was, hey, let's Let's investigate a more general question, which is the minimal number of, of triangles needed to cover a polytope. And a cover is a triangulation where you allow overlap. Okay. And the reason there's a connection here is uh, because any time you have a, uh, a triangulation, like with interior vertices, it naturally forms a cover if you just take if you just map the interior vertices to one of the corners. Okay, so if I just take this and I do the piecewise linear thing, some of these start to overlap. And now it's suddenly a cover. Okay? In fact, what we realized is it's, it's useful to do, if you do this, uh, then um, uh, uh, in a nice way, like if I decide to map this edge, to keep it along this edge, then this piecewise linear map is a map of the object to itself. And this labeling that you get by mapping 3 to vertex 3 and 1 to vertex 1 is a polytopal Sperner cut, a label. Oh, interesting. And it turns out that that was the key ingredient, which surprised us, uh, to actually closing the gap here and showing that 16 was the right number. Dimension 5, in case you're interested, the question's still open. The, the, the upper bound by construction is 67. The lower bound that we give is 60. And we don't know in dimension 5 what the minimum triangulation is. Somewhere between 60 and 67. All right, that's the first application. Second application, oh, pink pad. So if you are interested in dividing more than one object, Let's say you have two cakes and you want to divide them simultaneously. You might think, wait a minute. That, that's easy. Just do one and then do the other. Well, the problem with that is that, that what you just assumed is the cakes are separate objects. Whereas in reality, when we have more than one object, what you choose here may affect what you choose here. Okay? 
So now that the preferences are linked, uh, it's a more interesting question. And if you look at the space of divisions, it actually becomes a high dimensional polygon. It's a product of simplices. In this case, with just two cuts and two cakes, it's a square where the first uh, coordinate tells you which division in the, uh, in the first cake and the second coordinate is which division in the second cake. And it naturally will have further labeling if you ask people for their preferences. Because in this corner, where piece, both the right pieces have all the mass, you'd answer right, right. Here, you'd answer left, right. Here, you'd answer left, left, etc. Naturally polytopal. Naturally polytopal square label. Are you with me? OK. Um, you might be interested in this because, again, links, you might have link preferences. And what, you're in, what you want is a division of cake where different people choose different disjoint preference sets. Right? It would be bad if one, if, it, if AA and AB were the two people's preferences, because then they conflict on their first one. So this is a harder problem, not uh, obvious what to do. And in fact, um, you know, if you think about this in, sort of in terms of dividing salary pools among different shifts, um, it's a practical problem. And it's unsolvable, actually, even with reasonable assumptions, which is you wouldn't work for nothing. Okay? The problem is, you might have the first player that strongly force prefers the same shift, like morning, morning, or afternoon, afternoon, and a player who prefers different, uh, strongly prefers different shifts. Uh, and the preference sets, if you look at what's going on with the players, might be you know, strongly prefers same, strongly prefers different. Uh, there may be no way to resolve this with division of the cake into two pieces. And so we use various versions of polytopos firmer actually answer this question. If you, for instance, use more people, then you can find <coughs> only three divisions. So if you, look, if you have two shifts and two, three players, you can find always find at least two of the players where you have an end conflict who will choose a disjoint preferences. Um, or if you use more pieces, that is if you divide the day into three shifts, one of the days into three shifts, you can solve this problem. There'll just be an empty shift that you have to cover with some other one. Okay. Uh, and uh, if you have three cakes and two people, then it turns out this is a basically a 64 vertex nine-dimensional polytope. And you can solve this using polytopal spiral. Again, another undergraduate research project, um, which, um, uh, which was kind of interesting. Here's a third application. It's um, actually a very recent one. So when I was at um, uh, MSRI this last fall, um, there was a research program in, in topological combinatorics. This is one of the problems we worked on. A conjecture uh, was a, a question about a multi-labeled spurner. So if you have a spurner labeling, you have two different spurner labelings, red and blue. You can see in both cases they satisfy the spurner condition. One question you might ask is, what's the interaction between the two labels? If you like, you can think of this as uh, Alice and Carlos's preferences. What's the interaction between Alice and Carlos's preferences over these preferences? And uh, one of the uh, things you might uh, notice here in, in this picture is it turns out that, yes, you can always find a, a uh, let's uh, you can always find a, uh, a full uh, cell, a big 1, 2, 3 triangle in red, and a 1, 2, 3 triangle in blue. But it turns out you can also always find cells in which two of the players have different labels, and uh, the other two, uh, both players have two, at least two different labels. Okay? And so one way to think about what we just said here is put any partition of four into two pieces, you can always find a division where player one and player two have either one and three, two or two, or three or one different labels. Okay. The question is, is this, is this actually always true? Do you just know the number of players and people? And it turns out we were able to prove finally after, so this is interesting. This is also something that happens when you network. So I've been thinking about this problem for, uh, I don't know, maybe five years. Um, uh, a French mathematician, Frederick Meunier, and he's the one who, who had this conjecture, I think about maybe seven or ten years or something. And we got together 
we went to a talk, and after the talk, we were like, had some ideas, and we just started chatting, and suddenly it was like, oh my gosh, suddenly the scales fell off our eyes, and we're like, oh, we see a way to do this, right? It was from an idea in the talk. Um, and what we showed is, in fact, that for any partition of, of if you have n labels and n, n labelings and n different labels, if you sum them, subtract one, for any partition of that number, you can find the simplex where for each i, the i labeling uses ki labels. Or, if you provide it in another way, um, there's a, a simplex for which for each j, the j label is used a certain number of times. Okay? I'm not going to go through um, uh, this in detail, but I think you're getting the idea of, of the flavor of what we were able to prove. And so we proved a little more than the initial conjecture, which was, oh, you know what? I can actually look at the dual version here. If I divide 4 into 3 numbers, then I can find uh, uh, divisions of K, uh, sorry, uh, simplices here, where the, uh, where the, uh, for each number J, like the number one is used in at least two different labelings, and the number two is used in at least um, one different labeling, etc. Proof idea actually involved looking at a simplex of labelings and labels uh, using this piecewise linear map. Uh, that maps basically every vertex to a corner. And the interesting thing is, is looking for hunting down special rocks or pebbles to look at. So if you look at the, uh, uh, a, a rock near the center, it turns out that the inverse image under this map is always a simplex that has the two, two condition. If you look at some other special points, you'll have one, three, or three, one. You find, you actually find the special triangles by generalizing this idea that I showed you earlier about using piecewise triangles. And then another nifty thing was we said, oh, you know, actually, if you look at the very center, oh, yeah, so looking at the dual version actually gave you the other, uh, other version of this theorem. And if you look at the very center, something, something else happens. Uh, and this was something, uh, uh, a, uh, a result that had just been proved a year before. Uh, about the rental harmony problem. So this problem that I worked on, remember, from 1999. Well, some, uh, this group of, of uh, mathematicians, uh, Frederick McGay, who was the guy that was at this semester, Kelsey Houston Edwards, she makes these incredible uh, videos online, some of you may have seen on uh, uh, PBS Infinite. Uh, and another mathematician, they, they proved this theorem called the secret of roommate theorem, which basically says, if one person doesn't reveal her preferences, you can still find a division of the rent among several people such that uh, no matter, such that you can make everybody happy even if you don't know which, like suppose she's out of the room and you don't know what her preferences is. So there are four of you, but three of you are, one of you is not present. Three of you can get together, divide the rent in such a way that no matter, whenever she comes back, she'll be happy. There will always be an assignment that will make everybody happy. Okay. It's called the secret of roommate theorem. And we realized that our, actually, our multi square theorem will actually prove this in a different way. And then we realized the dual version actually says something that we didn't know was true, which we, we like to call now the survivor style roommate theorem, which says if you get, uh, you can always divide a cake into, if you have n people, you can always divide a cake into n minus 1. Pieces, uh, such that no matter who you boot off the aisle with that money, everybody else will be able to get as many pieces. <laughs> Which is nifty. It's amazing because of multi Ah, oh, that was great. And this is a 2018 result. We haven't published it yet, but it's, it's in submission. All right, good. So let me now finish by telling you the fourth application of this new game of chess. It always I found it was a little unsatisfying to me that you could prove a combinatorial result, which is that hex can't end in a draw, using a topological theorem. I mean, that's an amazing result, and I like that. But it seems strange to me that there ought to be a way, if Sparter is a combinatorial equivalent of Brouwer, and Brouwer proves hex, then Sparter ought to be able to prove hex. Are you with me? 
problem is hex is on a diamond and sprunter is on a triangle, yes? Aha, but there's polytopal sprunter, polygonal sprunter. Okay, so uh, let me show you now um, uh, how you might do this using <coughs> polygonal sprunter, the uh, version of a square, uh, rectangular sprunter. So here's the game, can hex end in a draw? Here's how we'll prove it, by contradiction. Suppose it can end in a draw. That means X's and O's have, have played their way through the board and every, every hex, the hexagon is now filled. Yes? Okay. So that's a labeling of every hexagon, yes? So if you don't mind, I'm just gonna turn every hexagon into a dot and I will uh, dualize the board by basically drawing an edge whenever the hexagons connect, etc. And so now would you agree that a finish configuration is a labeling of this diagonal, uh, this diamond-shaped triangulated board? Yes, it's a labeling by two layers, X and O. Yes? Okay. So, okay, well that's not rectangular sperma lemma, right? Two labels, I need four layers, yes? Okay, so here's what I'm gonna do. I'm going to change every X on the board to either an X1 or an X2. And every O that's on the board is gonna change to either O1 or O2. And which one it changes into depends on how that chain is connected to the X1 side or the O1 side. So let me give you an example here. So um, I, I'm gonna take an, an O and change it to O1 if there's, a, if there's a path of O's that takes me to the O1 side. Okay, so if this were O, it would be labeled O1 if there's a way to get here, yes? And it'll be labeled O2 if there's no way to get here. Are you with me? Whether or not it touches O2 doesn't matter. It'll be called O2 if it can't get to the O1 side. You with me? Similarly, for the X's, if there's an X, if there's a chain of X's to the X1 side, we'll label it X1. And if there's not a chain to the X1 side, we'll call it X2. Everybody to with me? So I've now taken this board that had two labels on it, and now there's four labels. X1, X2, O1, O2. You with me? Okay. Now, what's the labeling condition? What's the boundary conditions here? Well, if you think about this edge, would you agree if it's labeled X1, it's already touching the X1 side, so any X here has to be labeled, it has to change into an X1. However, if it's an O, it could either be O1 or O2. So this side has three possible labels. Are you with me? <coughs> so that's not a polygonal square. Hmm, interesting. What about this corner? If it's labeled O, would you agree it, it, it ha in this case, it, it, it has to be touching the O2 side, so it can't have a path to the O1 side. So if it's O, it changes to O2. And if it's X, it changes to what? It has to be X1 because it's already touching the X1 side. So every corner actually has two possible labels. Are you with me? Ah, that's not polygonal sprinter either. But if you just add a few more triangles to this board, place dots at each corner, and then fan out to the edges, would you agree? And then I'll call this X1. Would you agree that this is now a rectangular sprinter one? X1, O2, this has got to be one of two labels, yes? Now the only thing you have to verify is that you never, by doing this and adding these triangles, you never add a whole cell. And you can see that you'll never add a whole cell because this is X1, and O1 never connects to O2, and there's no X1, X2, so any triangle here will only have at most two labels. Okay, great. But by poly, by the rectangular Sperner lemma, this thing must have a full cell, yes? And if it's a full cell, it's not any one of the corners, yes? And if it's a full cell, though, it has only, it must have two labels that are either O or two that are X. And therefore, O1 touches O2, which is a contradiction. Because O2, O1 touches the O1 side, but O2 supposedly didn't. That's the rectangular using a proven axiom. Okay, good, so if you're interested, uh, I've got a bunch of papers at my website, but the, uh, the first one uh, is the one, the first couple are the ones that, uh, on which everything else is, uh, is built. 
Um, you might be interested that uh, one of the other things Elisha did was he didn't just uh, work on this, he also worked on implementing computationally um, a uh, fair division calculator using the Sparner model. And I, you know, I built this as an app back when applets were a thing on the web, uh, which I think they no longer are. Uh, but apparently, a few years ago, I got contacted by a New York Times reporter who was who basically used this to solve his rent division problem. Occasionally, I'll get letters from people saying, I used your calculator to solve my problem. This time, it was a reporter. And he, and he worked for the um, New York Times Interactive. And so he said, hey, you know, I did this with my roommates. It's awesome. Would you like to do this with the New York Times Interactive? I'm like, whoa, that's great. And he said, can you send me your code? And I said, sure, yeah, I'll give you my code. Uh, and so, and then I didn't hear from him for a, nearly a whole year. And then he wrote me back and he said, guess what, we finally implemented this thing as a uh, New York Times app, and it's live now. He wrote a, an article about it, and, uh, and then he coded this up. And so you can go to New York Times website. He did an amazing job with this. It actually works really well. He uses this, a version of his Sparner lineup to solve your rent problem. Uh, and now I get a lot more emails. It's, uh, I get a lot more traffic. <laughs> All right, anyways, I uh, hope you've enjoyed learning about Spurs Lama, and thank you very much. Yes. Oh, you're talking about the multi-cake division, the two-cake, two-person no, division? the two-person, two one-cake, the second one. Two-person, one-cake, okay. What, what doesn't work? Th that was what you said. Um, because they might vote for more. Oh, sorry, that's two-person, two-cakes. Two yeah, they might vote for more. Yeah, so... So, I'm wondering why... Yes, if, please. If they see the Yeah, so in the original uh, version, we're making no assumptions except that they, they don't like, uh, they don't want empty pieces, things like, uh, like that, right? So in the middle, there could be, you know, a reason of frosting here for which a reason, uh, you know, a person might prefer this piece of cake. We have no idea. Here, the assumptions I'm making are, again, that nobody uh, prefers empty pieces, or in this case, shifts where you, um, don't get any money. Okay. Uh, and all I and I didn't tell you the specific. I mean, I didn't. I didn't uh, tell you a specific example because um, uh, I was trying to be very general here. But I can. Let me just give you an sense here. So what I'm showing you here is that there exists player preferences and can't be satisfied. Not that every pair of player preferences can't be satisfied, but there exists a pair of player a pair of preferences. And the preferences look like this, where let's call this dotted line the first player's preferences. Here, what I'm showing you is for every division of cake, whether they prefer uh, AA or BA or BB or AB. And for this particular player, she prefer, strongly prefer AA to BB, but this particular set of preferences still satisfies the, the, the condition that empty pieces she'll never go for. Empty salary should never go. So I'm just showing you specific examples that can't be satisfied, uh, and that shows that there isn't a general solution to the problem. Yet you can't satisfy every player. Yes. Slide. Yeah. 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 Uh, in the 
So our result does not show the existence of such triangles. Yeah. And in this particular case, there aren't any. Okay. But it doesn't mean that by imposing some additional hypotheses that you know potentially you might get a stronger result. And then of course you have to ask the question: Does it? Is there some reason why you would want to impose that, those hypotheses using a nice application? So a great question. Yes. Yes, that's a great question. So, um, and I should have been clearer on this. So, the only time we're actually using the specific version of, uh, of um, the actual physical distances is the parameterization. So, we're not using them to do the labeling. So, for instance, um, so if I ask you what your preferences are here, it doesn't matter what the actual division is, it's just telling me, do I prefer, tell me in this division, with this particular set of pieces, which you prefer. He might go for the small piece, in which case he would, you know, he would label it whatever. He might go for two, even though piece one is very, very large. I just, all I assumed was that he would never go for piece two if piece one had all the pieces he was going for. So the labelings don't use the physical width. The, the only time physical widths are used is to actually specify the actual division, not which pieces you prefer. Great question. Yes, you and then you. Is it possible that maybe you have this area division that there's simply a reason to keep it in so everyone is strictly one out? Uh, yes, yeah, so you're asking another question that economists ask, which is the existence of an efficient division, right? So an efficient division is one that's what's called Pareto optimal. And uh, is there another division that dominates this one? And the answer to that question is possibly yes, if you aren't allowed, or if you don't uh, uh, require cuts by n minus one parallel knives. But the answer is no, if you if you are demanding parallel knives and only n minus one parallel knives. Yeah, certainly if you allow divisions into crazy cases, you might be able to have a dominating division. That's a great question. Yes. Yeah, great question. We're making no such assumptions. Um, we've decided in advance which player we're going to ask. We don't ask the other players. Oh. Yeah, and that's the that is the. Um, the owner division, I mean the owner labeling, we decide in advance who we're going to ask. Well, it's possible two, two people could choose the same piece, but, but in this, for this particular algorithm, we only ask one player with who they prefer, and we guarantee by the end that we'll have a one, two, three triangle corresponding to three different players. And that'll be close to an MD3 division in some sense. Yes. Great question. Yeah. Sticking on the theme of the <coughs> this this assignment of who gets to choose uh, in which situation, um, if you make different assignments, A, B, C assignments, uh, do you end up with different solutions of the problem? And does one solution tend to occur more frequently than the others if you uh, make these assignments randomly? Yeah. Those are great questions, and they have not been well studied. That is. It is possible that if we chose a different assignment of owners, that we will get a different solution. And um, uh, how how they compare is, is actually a really good right question for study. One more here, or one and two. That's a great question. 
grants and stuff. Like, I don't think I've gone to a talk like the Alvin Cowper did giving this talk and people asking me questions. This is great. Yeah, so uh, what you're asking here is, is uh, what, in what's, why can't you just stay inside the triangle that you found, right? And the answer is, uh, <coughs> uh, the answer is that it's not necessarily a one-two-three triangle when you subdivide. Did I have it here somewhere? Okay, anyways, can't find it now, that's fine. So when you take, when you find a small one-two-three triangle, if I were to subdivide that and label that, it would not necessarily be Sparta labeling it anymore because you wouldn't have the, the boundary conditions. So no, uh, the one, the the, big, the smaller subdivisions wouldn't necessarily find ones that are inside the bigger subdivision. That's why they might ward off in some direction. That's a great question. Ooh, last question. Necessarily. In fact, there could be, this is sort of related to your question, there might be several different uh, MD3 uh, divisions. And you might find different ones. All, that, all we know is that because of compactness, there exists a subsequence of triangle that converges to some point, but there may not be anything in this case. Yeah, very great. <coughs> Thank you again. Where somebody's preferences are here and these preferences. There is no point in the game where it touches in all the four regions, be they in the It's because the player preferences are in the are linked. It's kind of like you don't want the left seat to go on the right side. So there will not necessarily be. So what you're proposing is when I, the first player makes two divisions, right? that no matter what the second player chooses, he'll choose the other two. Yes. But there isn't necessarily going to be a division where the first player will prefer any one of these two other choices. And the way to see that is ignore the dotted lines, just look at the cross, look at these, the solid lines here. This is a specification of, for every pair of, the, of divisions, which uh, preferences the player wants, either left, uh, left, left, right, right, left, right, or whatnot. So, 
switch in this case, it was that player A wants the same chips and player B wants offset chips. Right? It was, that was we generally the same thing. somehow, but I'm not sure. How. General set of arithmetic. Let's make a guess. You force them to choose the same chips, but you can choose them in one day. Right? But what they choose in one day.